now we're going to move to your lecture on examining the optic nerve. I know you've, I, I've worked with Dr. Brandt for almost 20 years now. Uh, I've seen him give this lecture. I learn something new every time. I will tell you, even though there's all these fancy technologies, OCT and all that, really learning how to look at the optic nerve in a systematic way. Not just jumping to pathology, but no matter what you see, you go through things in the exact same steps, I think is very, very important. Thank you, uh, Hunter. And, and uh, it's always a pleasure to give this talk, and I want to give credit where credit is due. This is about a 20-year-old talk that was originally developed by a consortium of different doctors uh, who put th this together as a curriculum. And even though it's 15 to 20 years old, it's still totally valid. I've updated it with some examples from my practice and so on. And it's also nice when I give a talk like this sitting on an airplane because modern aviation is as safe as it is because of checklists. That's why aviation is safe, is because everyone does checklists. And so what I'm going to try to do in the next uh, 30, 45 minutes is to explain what you can have as a mental checklist for how to examine an optic nerve. For me, I've been doing it 30 years, it's sort of automatic and I can look at an optic nerve and say, oh, that's concerning or no, nah, this is probably normal. But that's based on seeing thousands and thousands of optic nerves. When you're starting out, having a mental checklist to go through uh, is still very, very important. So as I said, this was a curriculum that was developed by my colleagues uh, Bob Weinreb down at UC San Diego, Felipe Medeiros. I need to update this. He just moved to uh, Miami. Uh, and Ramo Susana in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it was originally called the Forge uh, series, and um, credit where credit was due uh, is due, and it, it's a great program. Oh, I'm going backwards. Wait a minute. Okay. So you all know that glaucoma is a characteristic optic neuropathy that has multiple risk factors. It's not just high pressure. It is an optic neuropathy that is very characteristic. The optic nerve has a limited number of ways to respond to injury and stress and damage. And glaucoma has a very characteristic pattern of change that is um, how we define this disease. It is, in fact, a progressive uh, damage to the retinal ganglion cells that manifests itself at the optic nerve. The exact cause of the ganglion cell pathology is still being worked out, but it's felt that it is probably um, damage that's occurring actually at the optic nerve head that's causing retrograde damage of the retinal ganglion cells. And when you have that damage, there is an associated loss of vision that starts in the periphery and eventually comes into the uh, center, as Dr. Um, Bahetti already showed you. Is this a glaucomatous optic nerve? Yes, no? Okay. So the assessment and documentation of the optic nerve and the visual fields needs to be paired together. Dr. Bahetti gave a talk about understanding the visual fields. And these are all components of confirming the uh, diagnosis here. And the clinical exam of the optic nerve with something as simple as a handheld direct ophthalmoscope is a key skill that's, that you need to have because not everybody has a $100,000 OCT that they can just send the patient to uh, to do, a, do an, an evaluation. And so what we're going to go through here is a organized checklist for how to examine the optic nerve using the tools that you have. Almost all of you have a direct ophthalmoscope, and almost all of you have a 90 diopter lens or something like it to examine the optic nerve at the, um, at the slit lamp. So there are five rules. This is a five-part checklist for understanding, um, evaluating the optic disc in glaucoma. First is to observe and figure out where the scleral ring is. Where is the edge of the opt optic nerve? That sounds like a dumb question, but often it's not obvious where the limits of the optic nerve. When you have examined thousands of optic nerves, you'll get a sense of what's a big optic nerve, what's a small optic nerve, 
and so on. And one of the one of the paradoxes of glaucoma is that for years we've talked about cup to disc ratio, and it's as if we're worried about the hole in the donut, whereas we really should be concerned about the donut itself because that's what the neural tissue is. And if you have the same amount of dough and make a really wide optic, wide donut, you're, you're going to be misled by understanding the, um, uh, what the cup to disc ratio means. So first rule is observe the scleral ring to identify uh, the optic disc and its size and identify the size of the rim. So you want to understand, as you can see here in blue, uh, where is the rim substance, okay? Next, you want to examine the retinal nerve fiber layer. Look at, you don't need an OCT, as I will show you, to be able to see whether there are abnormalities to the retinal nerve fiber layer. You just need to pay attention and get a mental catalog of normal and abnormal optic nerves so that you can start to have your brain say, hmm, something's not right here. Um, examine the areas of peripapillary atrophy, which surrounds the optic nerve. And this is one of the useful aspects of getting photographs at baseline when you start to see a patient because sometimes there can be subtle changes in the peripapillary atrophy uh, that indicates that things are changes, changing. And that's not something that OCT is going to tell you. OCT doesn't measure peripapillary atrophy. It measures other things that are very important. But this is a useful clue. And then to look for retinal and optic disc hemorrhages. And this is one of the most important things is I look at my patients, I look, try to look at the optic nerve at every visit, even if they're just coming back for a pressure check after stopping a medication. I always look quickly with a 90 diopter lens to see whether there's a, a disc hemorrhage, because that's almost a sentinel event that's telling you that the optic nerve sometime in the last few months was damaged or was stressed, or as is often the case, the patient wasn't taking their medicine and the pressure was high, and it enables me to have a conversation with the patient about that because this is indication uh, that uh, the nerve is having problems. So let's take, give you an example. So um, here is an optic nerve. That is the scleral rim. And we can argue about whether that truly represents the rim. There's a lot of studies going on with OCT identification of the rim doesn't always match uh, what we see clinically. But for all t intents and purposes, this is what you're looking at. And you can identify the scleral ring, and you have a vertical and horizontal disc diameter. I mostly pay attention to the vertical disc diameter or the overall size. And with practice, in a non-hypertensive patient that has really attenuated vessels, it almost jumps out to me based on the ratio of the blood vessels to the overall picture. Oh, this is a big nerve, this is a small nerve. You can use the five degree aperture on a standard um, direct ophthalmoscope. And if you basically scan it over the optic nerve, the five degree light spot is about the size of an average nerve. So you can just at the bedside, literally, scan with the, 20, with the five degree um, light and pass it over the optic nerve. If the optic nerve fits is small and fits inside that, you know you're dealing with a small nerve. If, on the other hand, the five degree circle is just in the middle of the cup, but it doesn't envelop the nerve, you're, you're, you know you're dealing with a big nerve. It's a really useful technique. You can also use biomicroscopy. You can adjust the size and the length of the slit beam uh, to identify the actual size. I like to use a 60 diopter lens, but you just have to make adjustments um, for the different magnifications. But it's not that important to be stuck with the numbers if you're consistently using it using a 90 diopter lens. Just get a sense of the range that you're seeing and especially if you do have an OCT and it says that the patient has a 2.75 um, millimeter optic nerve, 
you can get a sense of how that correlates to what you get when you examine the nerve. So the average vertical diameter and horizontal is about 1.8 millimeters. So if you're using a 60 Doppler lens and you dial in 1.8 millimeters, that's about correct. And these are the same magnification fundus photographs. Look at, this, look at the spread here of um, disk size. Um, that's 1.9. It's an average one. That's 2.4. That's a large optic nerve. And many people would say, oh, that's glaucoma. That's, um, you know, I, I worry that that patient has glaucoma because of the big cup to disc ratio. If you ran the OCT and looked at rim area, it would be an average rim area, and it would reassure you that the patient doesn't have glaucoma. And then there's the small optic nerve there. A caution is that small optic discs can have relatively minimal cupping and yet have already have significant damage. So you need to be uh, careful. They start off with relatively small um, uh, discs, uh, small cups, and that would concern me. It doesn't look that bad, but if I know that that's a small optic nerve, uh, it's, um, I'd be concerned about that. And you can see that there's rim thinning superiorly suggestive of glaucoma damage. You need to be careful with these myopic discs that have all sorts of peripapillary atrophy. Where do people think the nerve, uh, the edge of the nerve is? Okay, it's not this, but many people looking at this might think that this is the cup and this is the disc, uh, but that's the edge of the scleral rim, uh, the disc rim. And you can also see that it's basically been saucerized there. So identify the size of the neuroretinal rim. And the rim width is the distance between um, the edge of the scleral ring and where the tissue drops down, usually associated with a bend in the blood vessel. And there is something called the isn't rule, which says that in most normal optic nerves, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, but is a guideline, that the inferior rim is wider than the uh, superior then nasal, and then temporal. And you can see here, that's the uh, ISNT. And if it follows that rule and that sequence of widths of the, optic, of the rim, that's somewhat reassuring that this is probably a normal optic disc. Um, but, but you need to pair that assessment with the other things that we're talking about. Localized rim thinning and notching is uh, classic. And here you can see a notch of undermining. The isn't rule is violated here because the superior uh, rim is the thinnest going around. Can anybody see another pathology that we're going to talk about in a moment? Dr. Vahedi, you know what, what we're talking about. You can see thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer arcing out from that notch, okay? And that's almost definitely glaucoma. Here's another example. This blood vessel is dipping down and then goes back out. That used to be called bayonetting. We don't use that term anymore. And you can see the peripapillary atrophy in that area indicating that there has been loss of tissue there. The other important thing is to observe the color of the rim. This is exceedingly important. I've probably saved the life of one or two pa patients over the years, um, as have most glaucoma specialists who are paying attention to this, because a pale rim that is disproportionate to the degree of cupping is very concerning for an ischemic problem or a compressive lesion. And if I saw a disc that looked like this, I'd be concerned about a meningioma or an undiagnosed NIAON or something like that. But that's not glaucoma. Um, here you can see diffuse pallor, a cup that's not particularly uh, bad. And you can also see, as we'll talk about in a moment, um, diffuse loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer. 
So a pallor that's out of proportion to the degree of cupping is a non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy until proven otherwise. And these are the patients that you're going to want to send for neuroimaging. Okay? I, you know, just normal tension glaucoma is... I don't normally send for uh, neuroimaging. It's just a spectrum of regular glaucoma. But if there's any hint of pallor, then I start thinking about getting neuroimaging or having my neuro-ophthalmologist evaluate the patient. Examine the retinal nerve fiber layer. That's the uh, fourth R, if I'm counting correctly. Um, it's best performed using red free light. For those trainees and other people who have always wondered why there's a green light on a direct ophthalmoscope before we had OCTs, we used to flip a little green light in there, and it accentuates the retinal nerve fiber layer so you can see arcuate loss. You want to look at the striations, the brightness, um, how well you can see the blood vessels, and look for both diffuse as well as localized uh, loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer. Remember that the um, axons of the ganglion cells have this arcuate pattern that underlies the visual field changes, the OCT changes, and so on, and even the macular ganglion cell sc uh, scans, as I'll show you. Um, and if you use red-free illumination in a normal eye, you're going to see these bright striations coming up and down, uh, coming off the eye. It's even off the nerve. It's even more dramatic in children. And in children, you see this glistening, beautiful, healthy neuroretinal rim, uh, rather uh, RNFL. And this is a patient uh, provided to this uh, curriculum, I think, by Dr. Weinreb, who had serial photographs. This was the patient... I think 10 years earlier, and he developed glaucoma. Look at the difference of the retinal nerve fiber layer clinically between uh, before and after. And look how beautifully you can see all the capillaries and how hard it is to see them here. This is telling you that over time, uh, this patient has had a diffuse loss of retinal nerve fiber layer. Here's a normal RNFL. This is a large, large cup to disc ratio. A lot of people would be nervous about this, but this is a large nerve, okay? And that's probably a totally normal rim area if you did an OCT on this patient. And I would be totally reassured that I'm not really worried that this patient has glaucoma just based on the appearance of the retinal nerve fiber layer, as opposed to this eye, um, which has diffuse loss of the retinal nerve fiber layer, uh, as well as severe cupping. And you can get localized nerve fiber layer loss. You can use red free and see this, this, and over here you can see what it looks like clinically, and you can even make it out, and it's associated with a notch inferiorly. So the picture all needs to start making sense. And this would correlate to a superior arcuate scotoma in their visual field. One of the nice things about glaucoma is most of the time, not always, there's beautiful anatomic and functional correlation between the, um, uh, what you see on the clinical exam and what you see on perimetry and also what you see on OCT if you have access to that technology. Rule number four is to examine the region of peripapillary atrophy. And um, there is both beta zone and alpha zone um, pigmentation areas around the um, um, optic nerve. This was developed by my friend Jos Jonas in Germany. Um, I, quite honestly, don't use this that much to define glaucoma, but I use it very carefully if I have a baseline disc photo because the pattern of peripapillary atrophy tends not to change over time, except in high myopes where they're getting a really stretched uh, optic nerve, stretched uh, scleral canal. Um, but if I see changes in the peripapillary atrophy over time, uh, I, that will raise concern. And generally, the, uh, the beta zone um, peripapillary atrophy gets worse in the area where they're, it's inversely uh, 
proportionate to the rim width. So if you have a thin, thin rim in a certain area and you see peripapillary atrophy more um, in that area, that usually corresponds to a glaucomatous damage. But it's most useful to see it over time. Then, and as I said, I think one of the most important things is to look for retinal hemorrhages. They are indicative of glaucomatous progression. How disc hemorrhages happen is not fully understood. It's thought to be loss of laminar support at the insertion of the lamina cribrosa at the edge of the scleral canal. And as the um, uh, laminar fibers break and they each carry a capillary, the capillary breaks when it snaps open. Think of a trampoline. A trampoline has all those springs all the way around the trampoline. And if you break a couple, the force on the trampoline and on the, the is focused right there. That's where the most stress is. So if you follow a patient over time, you'll see a disc hemorrhage. And then a year or two later, they'll have another disc hemorrhage, usually in the same area or just next to it in one direction or the other. And so I really like the trampoline analogy because you've already created a focal uh, weakness in the laminar structural support. And then it starts to just unzip around the area where you started to see the uh, disc hemorrhage. So they tend to be flame-shaped because the blood tracks along the retinal ganglion, the axons. Um, and in the ocular hypertension treatment study, for which I was one of the PIs, um, we found that the presence of a disc hemorrhage increased your likelihood of developing glaucoma some sevenfold. And that was at the end of five years, and it was also confirmed later on with longer-term studies. And tomorrow, I'll probably give a talk on the ocular hypertension treatment study and other, other major studies if we have the time, but I'm going to go into that in much more detail. Disc hemorrhages are evanescent, but not just a couple of days. They usually take anywhere from two to six months to go away. And you can see here, and then this is the same eye months later on your right, and you can see that you're, you can see that something was there. Another reason that I like to get baseline disc photos in as patients when I'm starting to follow them for glaucoma is sometimes I'm scratching my head, is that a disc hemorrhage or is that an abnormal vessel that's visible, a choroidal vessel? Sometimes it's hard to figure it out, and sometimes um, you know, they're difficult to see. You know, I have patients where I see this, and I'm saying, hmm, was that there when I saw them two, three years ago when they, I started following them? And if it was there then and it was there every time I see them, it's not a disc hemorrhage. It's just probably an anomalous vessel under the surface of the, the, um, of the nerve. Similarly, uh, disc hemorrhages inside the lamina, such as on the, on the right, are relatively unusual, but when I see them, I always go back to my baseline photo and say, okay, is this really, was this there then? If it was not, that tells me um, uh, that it's, it's something new. So let's go through some examples and have you decide whether or not um, these examples have glaucoma. So you, let's use the rules. Ring, obviously you don't have the benefit of magnification and so on, um, but this looks to me like probably an average uh, size optic nerve. The size of the rim looks pretty good, but does it follow the isn't rule? I don't think so, because this rim, the inferior rim, is uh, thinner than the superior and it's probably thinner than the nasal rim as well. So it's violating the isn't rule. So that's a clue that something's wrong here. Examine the retinal nerve fiber layer. Does anybody see any RNFL defects clinically? Yeah, there's probably some dropout right here. Peripapillary atrophy, I'm not seeing any. And retinal and optic disc hemorrhages. Does everyone see the disc hemorrhage here? So this looks like a reabsorbing disc hemorrhage that may be two or three months old. 
but it's indicative that something's going on here. So, oh, they call it a small disk size. The rim thinning inferiorly is violated, so isn't is uh, violated. There's a localized defect. There's no significant peripapillary atrophy, and there's a reabsorbing disc hemorrhage. So this is a glaucomatous optic nerve. So is this a normal optic nerve? Go through the list. This is probably an average size disc. You have robust RNFL, no disc hemorrhage, no peripapillary atrophy, and a healthy rim that conforms to the isn't rule. This is a normal disc. So it's average disc size, follows the isn't rule, normal um, RNFL, no peripapillary atrophy, no disc hemorrhage. So this is a normal optic disc. Okay. Is this glaucoma? Who says yes? Show of hands. So you're saying yes, yes, yes. Anybody say it's normal? Okay. Whoops, let me go back here. Having trouble. Oh, you can use the arrows on this. Okay. So, I should have used these from the beginning. Okay. Um, so, it's hard to tell the size here, but you can see there's a vessel there that disappears. So, there's a notch all the way up to the superior rim and also to the inferior rim. You can see lamina coming very close. This is almost certainly glaucomatous. You can see a bit of a RNFL defect up there. So this is definitely glaucoma. This would, should jump out at you once you started systematically understanding how to look at these nerves. Here's another one. Is this glaucoma or not? This size average there's thinning of the rim inferiorly. There's diffuse loss of the RNFL, a little bit less right over here. There's peripapillary atrophy in the area of thinning. And there's no hemorrhages, but this is definitely glaucoma. Is this normal or not? What do people think? forget whether this, uh, yeah, this will do it. So this is a really large optic nerve, okay? The isn't rule is conformed to inferior, superior, nasal, temporal. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm using my fingers. I forgot that I'm on cyberside. I should be using the mouse to point. Uh, but you can see inferiorly, superiorly, nasal, and temporally. It follows the isn't rule. The RNFL is normal. You can see beautiful striations inferiorly and superiorly. There's no significant peripapillary atrophy, and there's no hemorrhage. So this photograph often surprises people when they see this as an example and, and we say it's normal. But now I think you understand using the checklist and starting to think about disk size and thinking about the other things that are part of this checklist of how useful they are um, for uh, glaucoma. Here's another one. Is this glaucoma or is this normal? I don't know if this has the seat. Whoop. So it's an average disc. There's rim thinning inferiorly. You can even see this blood vessel here, this blood vessel here, uh, drop in to an area. And I'm uh, getting ahead of myself, but you can see there's an associated area of peripapillary atrophy, and that might even be a reabsorbing uh, disc hemorrhage there. So there's diffuse loss of the RNFL inferiorly, but the, the R RNFL is actually pretty good superiorly. 
There is betazone peripapillary atrophy inferiorly, and there's a reabsorbing disc hemorrhage right there. So this is definitely glaucoma. So here are some examples. This is an example from my practice um, that I've added to this, uh, this program. Do pe people think this is glaucoma? Okay. Did I? Uh... So the nerve looks reasonably healthy. Okay, um, but you see the disc hemorrhage, and that should draw your eye to that area, and it should draw your eye to looking at the RNFL in that area. And you can see quite nicely this patient had a disc hemorrhage, and you can see there's a very small arcuate uh, RNFL defect there. So. We didn't talk about the differential diagnosis of disc hemorrhages. What are some of the differential diagnoses of disc hemorrhages? It can include diabetic problems. It can also include recent posterior vitreous detachments, because a PVD will sometimes cause a little bit of a blood there. But the fact that there's a, di if I only saw this disc hemorrhage and nothing else, I would probably just watch the patient and see if anything changed assuming that everything was normal otherwise. But in um, uh, this case, we got a, an HRT, I guess this was, um, or this is an, yeah, this is an HRT, which called everything normal, but then when we did OCT, you can see, look up here, you have this beautifully defined RNFL defect in this area and emanating perfectly out from the, um, uh, from the area where the disc hemorrhage is. This was before we did ganglion cell scans, but I'm sure that she would have had a corresponding uh, ganglion cell change. This is another example from my clinic, um, and these were um, what he looked like in uh, 2020. And here you can see he has thinning of the rim superiorly, and he has a history of pigmentary glaucoma. And here's what he looked like 10 years previously, which looked suspicious, but maybe not enough to call as glaucoma, and he was intermittent in his follow-up. But we did get serial photographs over the year, and you can see, over the years, and you can see a progression from 2010 to 2014 uh, to 2020, and we did start treating him somewhere in the middle here, uh, but you can see how the optic nerve changes over a decade uh, with uncontrolled glaucoma. And here um, is his visual field that shows this early arcuate and nasal step in the left eye uh, and the corresponding superior um, notch and RNFL defect in the left eye as well. This is a recent patient that Dr. Vahedi and I dealt with recently. He was referred to me by an optometrist um, for ocular hypertension and sus suspicion of glaucoma. And they, the doctor was concerned about cupping asymmetry. His pressures were in the low 20s. His pachymetry was slightly above average. Um, but he felt that his vision uh, in one eye was getting a little bit more hazy in his right eye. And I think we detected a trace afferent pupillary defect. So there was clearly something going on. And here are his two optic nerves. And what I want to show you, um, this was just uh, September, last month. And he, these are his two optic nerves. And you can see the thinning inferiorly and the corresponding, I'm sorry, I'm pointing with my fingers instead of the mouse. So you can see inferior thinning and this beautiful RNFL defect. You don't need an OCT to see that, but you got to look. And this is what his OCT showed. And beautifully, it demonstrates also uh, in the ganglion cell. Um, and here you can see in the ganglion cell scan uh, a per, uh, raffe sign and a beautiful example of the um, 
uh, arcuate laws. So what do you think the visual fields are going to show? They show a paracentral arcuate loss, um, and that corresponds exquisitely to this, and also explains his symptoms because he has, per, uh, you know, perifovial visual field loss. So, summarize: uh, we're crunched for time. I've got to go deal with the patient in the operating room, but um, I hope that this has given you some basis for having a mental checklist as you go through an optic nerve exam and really understand how to sort of in a standardized way go through and confirm the diagnosis. Thank you very much for your attention.